Good evening. This is Robert Sanjanis coming to you once again on the Robert Sanjanis live program. This time for Wednesday, March 16th, one day before St. Patrick's Day. Glad you could be with us here tonight. We had a little technical difficulty at the beginning, so if that scared you away, please come back, call your friends and neighbors and tell them everything's okay. As you know, this program is set aside for you to ask your questions, give your comments on any topic whatsoever. And I, as my role as host of this program, will endeavor to answer your questions to the best of my ability using our Catholic faith, the Bible, tradition, the saints, the doctors, the philosophers, the councils, the popes, and just about anything I can find to help you walk away satisfied that your question has indeed been answered. We come to you every Wednesday from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Unless something happens and something almost happened tonight, but we fixed it. So here we are. I'm still getting used to the changes that everybody makes on their programs and their their platforms and all kinds of things. It's a whole new vocabulary, a whole new world to get used to. But the march of progress leads us on, and here we are. So. Um, before we get into our uh, questions for tonight, um, I do have two issues to cover. One is a two questions from somebody, and the other is a question from last week that I told the person I would be investigating, and that dealt with uh, Tobit, a question from t the book of Tobit. Now, I don't know if you've ever read Tobit or not, but that's in the Old Testament. Don't try to look for it the new. And um, kind of an interesting little story about Tobit, very faithful man of God. Um, but the question was, if I remember correctly last week, um, you know, can demons marry humans? And, and my answer was no. And he also wanted to know if that was true, if there was a mistake in the Bible. And I said, no, there's no mistake in the Bible. And then I told him I would go look at the passage and see if there's any difficulty there. And I did. And there's no difficulty. For those of you who want to know, this would be Tobit chapter 6, verses 13 to 15, I believe it was. And um, in that story, all that's happening uh, for those of you who are interested in Tobit is that um, the man is complaining that if he marries this woman, uh, he might die because... Um, seven of her previous husbands have died. And um, that was caused by a demon. And so I don't know how the question got formulated where the demon could marry this woman, but that has nothing to do with um, what Tobit's going through at this point. Um, and, and the angel Raphael tells him how he can avoid the demon um, killing him if he uh, marries this woman. So, um, that's all that's to the story, nothing more. And uh, so I hope that clears up your confusion. Um, we did have a question from a um, another patron, and um, I'm gonna, it has to do with Fatima. And um, here it goes. Um, you stated on several occasions that Pope John Paul II didn't have any explicit command from heaven to do his consecrations, including 1984, and that such attempts at these consecrations are somehow superfluous. How do you know this? Or is it simply because there is no record of Sister Lucia stating as much? Further, even if there were no actual requests from heaven, would they not at least carry some grace rather than being superfluous? as well as those by his predecessor, Paul VI, and successors, including Pope Francis. Um, okay, and there's another question, but let's let's deal with this one first. Um, you know, heaven can do whatever it wants to do, okay? Uh, we just don't have any evidence that um, from heaven, I mean, because if you're going to question me, that's okay. But... Um, heaven hasn't given us any information to answer your question so it's like who knows okay who knows whether heaven would give a grace or it did give a grace to john paul ii because he did a consecration 
Okay. You just don't know. I'm sure it's possible. Okay. Um, so that answers that part of the question. And then you ask me, um, um, heaven, um, did not, I say heaven did not communicate with John Paul II. Um, and you asked me how I know this. Well, because if heaven was communicating, John Paul II would have said so, or Sister Lucia would have said so, if we still have the, the you know, the real Sister Lucia, which I brought up last week as, a, as another problem area. Okay, um, they would have said so, but they haven't said so. So the logical conclusion is heaven hasn't communicated with us. And um, <clears throat> the last time we know that heaven communicated with Sister Lucy was 1952. So, um, and that brings us back to the whole Pius XII thing, which is the point I was trying to make yes, uh, last time, which was, look, we know heaven was involved then because Jesus appears first to Pius XI to tell him to do the consecration, and he never did it. And then he, and Jesus appears with Sister Lucia, and she consults with Father Consalves, and they figure out a plan. Let's ask Jesus if he'll accept a consecration of the world from Pius XII. And, um, um, and, and they go to Jesus, and he says, okay, um, but you at least need to mention Russia. And they bring that back to uh, Pius XII, and he fails to do it. And then Jesus says, well, because you failed to do it, the war is going to go on two and a half more years. Otherwise, it would have stopped immediately. Um, and the conversion of Russia that was supposed to happen at the same time, that's not going to happen until later. Because you did a, you know, <laughs> halfway job on this consecration that you were supposed to have done correctly in 1942. And then um, so so we know heaven's communicating with the Pope, with Sister Lucia. We know it's the right time. Uh, you know, the 30s and 40s when uh, Russia was at its peak in atheism and even got worse from 1917 through 1929. So all the cards are in play. I mean, it's an easy analysis if you want to look at it from a logical point of view. You don't have to strain here or there. Um, is heaven communicating or not? I mean, it's clear as day. Heaven's communicating. And then heaven communicated again in 1952 in um, April. It's April, May, no, I'm sorry, May. May of 1952 when Our Lady came to uh, Sister Lucia and said, tell Pius XII I'm still waiting for the consecration of Russia. And then he did it two months later. So, again, it's clear as day that heaven's communicating. And since heaven didn't come back after 1952 and say, uh-oh, uh, Pius XII made an error. We have to do it all over again. Heaven didn't do that. So we assume heaven accepted it. Because when heaven doesn't accept it, we know what happens. Jesus comes and says, okay, you didn't do it right. Here's, here's the punishment that's going to happen. You know? You're going to go through war for two and a half, four years, and the conversion of Russia is not going to come until later, way later. Okay, so when when we don't do it right, heaven tells us. When we do do it right, they keep quiet, and we go on. Okay, so those are facts. That happened. We don't have to make up any stories or gap fillers or, you know, you know, try to make an excuse for why John Paul II is not mentioning Russia or this or that, okay? All these things, they were done by themselves. John Paul II, whoever the Sister Lucy was at that point, they're all talking after the fact. And it does, you know, there's no authority there from heaven that we can back it up with and say, oh, yeah, these people are talking for Jesus. Nothing. There's nothing there. Plus, we got the Sister Lucy changing her mind in the 1980s about whether the consecration was good or bad. So that stinks to high heaven. And anybody worth their analytical salt is not going to let that pass without some critical thoughts. Um, so and now, that, now, of course, that all leads us to 
Pope Francis. Let me see if this second question deals with Pope Francis. Uh, no. But I'm sure that question's coming tonight. <laughs> Pope Francis pulled a sly one on us, didn't he? So he was going to consecrate Russia and the Ukraine. So, okay. So, I, I mean, again, you, if you want my opinion on it, here it is. Um, um, I think Pope Francis is part of the cabal, actually. The Western cabal, uh, wherein he does the bidding of his masters, and they happen to be NATO, the United States, and whoever else is pulling the strings. And <clears throat> um, when the Ukrainian you know, leader asks or the uh not not the ukrainian leader the um metropolitan or or whoever the krill i think it was who asked the pope to do a consecration of russia and the ukraine um and 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 um pope francis concedes and says he's going to do one march 25th oh well that's the same day that john paul ii uh supposedly did his consecration and that failed um to me this is all theater it's all theater. It means nothing. Now, our, our questioner said, you know, could God give some grace for Pope Francis when he consecrates Russia and the Ukraine? God can do whatever he wants. OK, um, but I mean, if, if this is being touted as the fulfillment of the 1929 request from Our Lady to consecrate Russia. If you do it under that pretense, heaven is just going to turn its face away and say, you're just a bunch of liars. Okay, look, this has already been done. It's all been taken care of. So let's not form these theatrics and try to make it look like, wow, after how many years? 90 years, we finally, uh, 92 years, we finally, 93 years, we finally get on the track. And, you know, we're going to do the consecration of Russia. You know, th these are the henny pennies walking around the world thinking because, you know, Russia is going into the Ukraine, you know, the end of the world could be here. You know, everybody's clamoring and all the Fatimists are coming out and saying, oh, well, see, that's what happens when you don't do the consecration of Russia, you know, blah, 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 blah. And nobody bothers to look at what's really happening in this area. And it's been happening for quite a while. And. The culprit in this is not Russia, it's the United States, okay? They've been pushing their muscle around for decades, and they want this hegemony all over the world. They want the, the dollar to be the reserve currency so they can control the world, all the bankers out there. And, um, and now there's a, a, a hint that Russia... And China, perhaps Iran and Brazil and some other countries might form a, um, a new monetary uh, system that they don't have to depend on the U.S. reserve dollar. And the U.S. sees that its, its power is shrinking over the world. And in order to keep that going, what do you think we go into all these countries for? Take them over and put in puppets for us. Because we keep the reserve dollar going. That's how. Because if they have to use our money and we control the money, well, we control the world, basically. Okay? And with all that money, we buy a big army to defend it so nobody takes it away. That's what NATO is. Okay? Now NATO, there's two countries left. What, Belarus and Russia? China also, who, who aren't part of the reserve dollar system. And so what do you think the U.S. is going to do to keep the hegemony going? Yeah, they're going to go in there and try to take over Russia or make Russia look like the big boogeyman. And so they can put the you know nuclear facilities on the border of Russia, which they've been planning and doing for the last, what, decade or so. OK, they put they, they took out the duly elected Poroshenko in 2014 and stuck a puppet in there, Zelensky. And so they could do what they wanted to do in Ukraine. OK, so they're not fooling anybody. Anybody who knows their salt about this knows what's going on. 
is just another push to put the pressure on Russia so that they can break up this Russia-China deal that's going on. So everything reverts back to the U.S. having control over everybody. Okay? That's what's going on. And Putin told them this. If you start putting nuclear facilities in the Ukraine on our east, our western border, okay, you can depend upon it that I'm going to go in there and clear them out. He told them that a long time ago. And so what did they do? They went and did it. And he did exactly what they knew he was going to do. Go into Ukraine and take them out, along with some other stuff like, you know, uh, child trafficking and all kinds of dirt that's going on from Western society that um, that is now trying to infiltrate into Russia. And Russia's trying to clean up its act. They've been doing that for the last 30 years, and they've been doing a pretty good job of it, morally speaking. So who's the big bad wolf here? It's the United States. Russia's just trying to defend themselves. If, you know, if somebody came and put a gun to your head, and said, this is what you're going to do. And that's what the U.S. is doing to Russia right now, putting a gun to their head and saying, you're going to do what we want you to do. And Russia takes the gun from the guy's hand and, and, and shoots him in the arm or the leg and, and paralyzes him. Okay, well, that's their right to do. We did the same thing with uh, Cuba. You know, when the Russians were over you know, going setting up nuclear facilities. In Cuba, same exact thing the U.S. is doing in the Ukraine and pointing them toward Russia. That's the gun pointing at their head. What did we do? Well, Cuba wasn't our part of the United States, but we told Russia, if you go into Cuba, you're going to start World War III because we're not going to allow you to do that. So you see, when, it, when the shoe's on the other foot, the United States complains and says, well, you can't come near our borders and put up nuclear facilities because we know why you're doing that. And the Russians know why the U.S. is putting nuclear facilities on the uh, eastern border of the Ukraine. This is, this is, you know, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to figure this out. You know, where let's say Russia wanted to put nuclear facilities in Mexico. You know, what will we do? We'd say, you step one foot in Mexico. And you're done. You're toast. That's what we would say. Okay. Same thing Russia's doing over in the Ukraine. Oh, but no. See, in, in order to get to every the news media and everybody, you can't you can't even watch the news anymore without seeing something said negatively about Russia. Okay, and that's because the news media is controlled by all these bankers, and they basically do the bidding of them. OK, and you all know, all know who I'm talking about. All right. So that's what's going on over there. So all this, you know, we're going to do a consecration of Russia. So the Pope's getting on it and say, yeah, Russia's the bad boy. When he doesn't realize that Russia's just defending itself against U.S. aggression and NATO aggression. Um, you know, <laughs> it's all theater. Like I said, it's all theater. It means nothing. And I wouldn't expect having to pay attention to this any more than they don't pay attention to anything else that's going on in the Vatican these days. Okay. Cause it's all corrupt. So that's, that's the reality of the situation. So, you know, all this clamoring you're going to he be hearing day in and day out. Oh, finally the consecration is going to be done. You know, <clears throat> That and the college education will get you a job. <clears throat> or, as I can say now, that and $4.95 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. All right. That's second question. Um, in dealing with the conversion of Russia issue, you seem to imply in your latest book on Fatima that from the beginning of the second millennium, orthodoxy is some kind of acceptable second option to being a Catholic. Is this possibly just a way of trying to make your position fit? No. And I don't say that it's a second option, like you're out shopping for a car and you don't want to buy the, the Honda, you'll settle, settle for a, a Toyota. 
that's and that's the way you put it in your question. That's not the way I put it. Okay. The way I put it is, okay, some big mistakes were made back in 1054 and in the 1400s when they tried to get back together and things weren't done the way they were supposed to be done. So yeah, we had some mistakes made. And now we have two branches of Christianity. Um, but does that mean that, that the that the branch that came out uh, because of the mistakes is automatically of the devil? Or are they can be considered Christians? Okay, well, the church has already answered that question. They said they can be considered Christians. So, um, and they have the sacraments, they have the priesthood. If that doesn't make us Christian, what does? Okay, so that's what I based my comments on. Because of what they have left remaining after all the mistakes have been made, are they still considered a Christian entity? And yes, the answer is yes, they are. Okay. So, um, unless there's any kind of movements, major movements being made to restore orthodoxy to Roman Catholicism, which I don't see, everybody's talking a lot, but I don't see any movements. Well, what do we do with that condition? Well, they remain Christian. Okay, yeah, they got some bumps and bruises and maybe a limb missing here or there, but they're still Christian. Okay, so that's how we treat them. As a matter of fact, some of their Christianity is a lot better than the Christianity that's going on in Roman Catholicism today. Okay, um, I don't think they have the pedophilia homosexual problem that we have. By far. Okay. And they don't have the kind of bishops that we have. These weak, do nothing, have three meals a day, and get fat kind of bishops that we have in the United States. Some of the most dedicated Christians I've ever seen are in Russia. These people have suffered a lot. They know what it is to be Christian. We in the United States, the only wars we have are the ones we create. Okay, and that's in order to take over the rest of the world because we think we're so hot. Here's a nation that's $27 trillion in debt that they have no way of ever paying off. The GNP doesn't even come close to even matching what our debt is per year. And yet we throw our weight around the world like we're just God's gift to the world, you know, with this democracy yeah all that is is just another way to sneak into countries take them over take their resources and make them our slaves okay and we're good at that we started that out when we you know in, in the 1800s with the slave market and now we're paying the price for it okay when the immigrants came over they were paid low wages and it's basically a slave market so the capitalists that came over here, boy, they've been enjoying it and making everybody else their slaves, including the rest of the world. And they're not going to be happy until they take over the whole world. And that's what they're trying to do to Russia and China today. Okay. And Russia and China are saying, you know what? We're going to draw our line in the sand. And this is one of those moments where Putin is drawing his line in the sand and you're not going any further. And if you try to go any further, then you're going to start World War III. Okay? So these kinds of things have actually worked out for us because when you start thinking about the MAD policy, mutual, mutual destruction, nobody wants to go there. And so this is what's held all these major countries in balance for this long. And I'm surprised it's lasted this long, but it has. Because the MAD policy works. Nobody wants mutual destruction. And that's what Russia, if Russia didn't say that, then hey, it would be hunky-dory for the United States that go in there and start taking over Russia uh, bolt by bolt until they were done. And Putin said, no, you're not going to do that. So, yeah, we have another line drawn in the sand, just like Kennedy drew his line in the sand with Cuba. 
but the shoe happens to be on the other foot now. Okay. So all this you know, consecration of Russia, like Russia's the big boogeyman. No, Francis doesn't have a clue again, what the real story is. Okay. And probably because his advisors are, you know, telling him about pack of lies. All right. So, um, all right, so I answered the orthodoxy question. All right, so let's go to our board here. Uh, John, you can bring up the first question for tonight. Okay, Dr. Sinjetis, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't figured that out. John, I guess you haven't figured out a way to put those questions up on the top, huh? <laughs> which would be a lot easier for me. Um, I heard debater Darth Dawkins, Protestant, say recently in a debate that Catholicism teaches... God's existence is highly probable, not certain. Is there any truth to that? <laughs> this is how rumors start. Um, no, there's not one ounce of truth to that at all. Okay. There's two sources from how we know God exists. One is revelation and the other is reason. Okay. Neither one of them say that uh, it's a probable certainty. Okay. Uh, John says, you scroll with your mouse to the top. I'm going to in, going in order that they came in. Oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, I like you better putting the questions up there, John, because it makes it move real fast. So um, let me see here. Um. Okay, go ahead, John. Next question. Robert, do you wish, do you wish, dare we hope that Pope Francis and von Balthasar are right and all dogs go to heaven? <laughs> and the theology that all roads lead to grandma's house is true. <laughs> Joe, you have a sense of humor. Um, who doesn't, Joe? Who doesn't wish that all men would be saved? I mean, we're just following our creator when, if we say that. Because he says in 1 Timothy 2.4, God desires that all men be saved. And that's a true desire. You know, some, some Calvinists want to live in Thomas also. And Augustine, at least in one of his four interpretations of that passage, says that, well, you know, God can't really desire all men to be saved because it's already programmed. It's already determined, you know, how many are going to be saved, blah, blah, blah. Uh, no, sorry, that's not how we read the Bible. OK, that's when you can take your logic and throw it out the window, because here you have an indicative statement uh, uh, backed up by the Holy Spirit who doesn't lie telling us that God desires all men to be saved. So if God desires all men to be saved, why wouldn't I desire all men to be saved? I hope they do all go to grandma's house. That's what we're here for. What do you think I do this every Wednesday for? Yeah, to bring them all to grandma's house. But they're not going to listen. That's the problem. And if they do listen, they mock us. That's the, that's the problem. It's not that we don't desire them. You know, Von Balthasar, if he had stayed on the true blue, he would have figured that, yeah, it's not bad to, to hope that all men would be saved. Okay? But when, you, but when you then advance that argument and you say that, well, um, it's most likely that all men are going to be saved or with the other liberals of his day, including, you know, um, Bronner and Kuhn and um, um, Father Brown and many, many others. And even John Paul II has been accused of this. That is of universal salvation. That somehow God started the problem and now it's his responsibility to fix it. That's how these guys think. And part of this is due to the evolutionary model that they use. 
Um, this was this was um, Father Brown's problem, Raymond Brown. He was so high on this uh, Protestant theologian, Karl Barth. Uh, and Barth said that there was really no original sin. And man evolved to where he is today. And so that means that man is what God made him to be. What God, or you could say where God allowed him to evolve into what he is today. That's an evil being. So it wasn't an original sin. They, these liberals, Protestant and Catholic, have been trying to get rid of original sin for about 100 years or more. And the church hasn't budged, of course, and she never will budge because the gates of hell will not prevail. But this is the, this is the mentality these guys have. So Karl Barth, the Protestant that our Catholic father Brown followed and learned his trade from, Remember, Father Brown taught at a Protestant seminary for 20 years or more, Union Theological Seminary in New York. No wonder he talks like Protestant, liberal Protestants do. And um, so if man evolved to what he is today and there wasn't an original sin to make him evil, that means God basically had him evolve to be evil. So if, it's, if God's the one that did it, then God's responsible to fix it. And how do you fix it? You fix it by universal salvation. Just save everybody. See, and von Barthelsar was a liberal too. But he was a little bit more Catholic than Father Brown was and was afraid to say, yeah, there's universal salvation. And so he wrote a book, Dare We Hope. Okay? And that's how it could pass muster from the censor librorum so that he wouldn't get tagged and have his book rejected but yeah and and whenever you put a question mark on the end of a sentence in catholicism yeah nobody will touch you because you're not saying you're not asserting you're just asking a question there's nothing wrong with asking questions father brown was famous for doing that okay and that's how it, that's how he would I'll get all his false doctrines out just by putting a question mark at the end of a sentence instead of a period. Pretty good tactic. All right. So next question. Are you, are you familiar with the Eastern Orthodox arguments against divine simplicity and in favor of energy essence distinction? Is this a topic your knowledge enough to debate and EO on? Um, well, you know, I, I'd have to brush up on this, but um, the way I would see it, um, um, I have problems with the simplicity argument, okay? I have problems with Thomas Aquinas. Not everything. Um, he's very good at some things, but there are other things that Thomas has said that I just I even wonder if they're Catholic or Christian for that matter. Okay. And one of them is a simplicity thing where now, you know, God is simple. So then you argue from the simplicity factor and you make all these conclusions. But if your premise is wrong, you know, that God's simple. Uh, now, if you define the simple in the sense that, you know, God has no parts and things like that. Yeah, I understand all that. But it's the extrapolation from that uh, premise that I have problems with Thomas. And one is his, you know, doctrine of absolute necessity, where everything is, and they're all connected. You can't separate the simplicity from the absolute necessity or the cause and effect, which he got from Aristotle. Okay. Um, and, and the, the fact that Thomas doesn't really believe in a personal God, that's another problem I have with him. It's just everything's based on being. Well, being's impersonal, okay? Being's impersonal. And yet being's supposed to produce goodness because a being can't destroy itself, so it must, must be good if it can't destroy itself, okay? Um, do we really want to go there? In this metaphysical line of thought, 
Um, and then we cut out half of what God is, and that is he's a personal being. And that's why he makes personal creatures made in his image. Um, so, you know, you have a problem there with the whole being argument. And all the Thomas do the same thing. Everything's based on being. And if you, you know, talk to some of these guys, they're, they have no emotions. They have no um, personal understanding of God. They're the people that tell us we can't even talk to God or God doesn't talk to us because he's so other. He's so beyond what we can think. And is that really the God of Scripture? Is that the God of Catholicism? I don't think so. And so this whole simplicity, being, absolute necessity argument that Thomas gives, I think, takes us further away from God than brings us closer to God. Okay? And I could go on and on about that. But, John, could you bring up that question again? Because... I just want to make sure I got all of it. Yeah, so the energy essence thing, where in now the the energy of God is is not not different from God, but it's how God expresses Himself. Wherein His essence never changes, but His energies can be manifested in many different ways. Okay, that I can I understand. And I, and I see the value of that in, in trying to understand God, if you want to look at him metaphysically. Okay? But what I'm saying is, look, you just take God at face value. You know? You read scripture, you read the fathers, and, you know, you just take God without having to try to explain everything. You know? Because you're going to end up going off the deep end. If you try to explain everything and um, you know what, our feeble minds can't figure it out. And you, the proof of that is you've got a lot of competition with Thomas. You know, you've got um, all the people on the other side of the fence, including the Molinists, who were probably halfway between. And nobody's really ever figured it out with all the explanations everybody's offered. They've never figured it out, okay? And you either end up like Thomas or John Calvin or Martin Luther, where everything's absolute necessity. All cause and effect, and everything's predetermined, like somebody wrote out a script. Or the other side of that is we all have free will, and God just plays a little part in that. And, uh, and that's the other error, of course, you know, that you go into. Um, but nobody's ever figured it out and nobody ever will. Okay. So even answering this question bothers me because dealing with all these metaphysical things, um, there are so many contradictions in metaphysics that it's almost laughable. Okay. So, um, I have a tendency to try to stay away from it because I never come out joyful when, I, when I'm reading metaphysics. I always come out with another question is what I come out with. And that's not satisfying. The God of love and joy and peace is satisfying to me. Okay. And basically, that's all we're really going to understand in this life until we see God himself. And he can explain it all to us. All right. Next question. Didn't Jesus defend Tobit to the Sadducees? He told them they were ignorant of the scriptures. Well, Jesus didn't quote from Tobit, okay? Um, but it is interesting that the seven, um, the seven uh, husbands <laughs> that this woman had <laughs> matches the, the number seven that Jesus uses. Uh, or no, that the Sadducees use uh, when they're when they're trying to uh, trap Jesus. So you know they they think if they make it more complicated than saying one or two husbands, that Jesus is somehow going to you know be um, flummoxed, that he won't be able to answer them. Um, but you know you could say seventeen husbands and it wouldn't make any difference. Um, so 
I, Jesus wouldn't go back to Tobit because Tobit doesn't give an answer to that question. The only thing Tobit's worried about in that section we just read is if this man does marry this woman and becomes her eighth husband, will he be safe from this demon? That's the only question involved there. So um, we can we can lay, lay Tobit aside. What's interesting about Jesus' whole answer um, is that he says, you don't know the scriptures and you don't know the power of God. Now, the power of God is mentioned because th that is the source of where we are going to get our new spiritual bodies from. See, right now we have our soul is saved. Our spirit is saved because we've been baptized. But our body is just as good as dead. Okay. And so we need a new body. We need a body that is incorruptible, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. So that's what God is going to give us. And Jesus gave us a glimpse of what that's going to be like on the Mount of Transfiguration. When his clothes were gleaming white and his face was like the sun and the way the different gospel writers describe it is just amazing. And uh, the apostles are scared out of their wits. They don't know what's going on. But that's the example that Jesus is giving us of what we're going to be like, because we're going to be just like him. Okay, so that's the power of God that Jesus is referring to when he says the Sadducees don't know the power of God. Okay, and then he says, um, he says to them, um, you don't know the scripture. Now, this is interesting because in that passage, the Sadducees and the Sadducees, you have to understand, they only believe the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Old Testament. The Pharisees believed everything, the wisdom literature, the poetry, everything, but not the Sadducees. So the Sadducees, uh, and they were like the aristocracy of the Jewish society, the Sadducees. They were, you know, like the untouchables, you know. <laughs> The Pharisees were more of your common heretic, and the Sadducees were more uh, sophisticated uh, in their heresies. But they had their heresies, and here was one of them. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Okay, so they pose that they get this uh, obscure passage from Deuteronomy twenty-five, verse five, which says that if a husband dies. The brother has to keep his seed going, and, and he, he marries his wife, his former, the brother's wife, who had died. Um, and, and so the Sadducees try to make this thing about that passage and say, well, she had seven um, husbands who died. So who's, who's going to be her husband in the afterlife? Okay. Now, this passage, Deuteronomy 25, 5, says nothing about the afterlife. That's number one. And so the, the Sadducees think they're really cool because they can go and extract this, this um, very important information about whose husband is going to, she's going to have in the afterlife, knowing that they don't even believe in the resurrection. So in, in their minds, there is no afterlife. OK, but this is in the Bible. And so they twist it to make it look like there's going to be this problem if there is a resurrection, because now we can't figure out whose husband she is uh, or wh what husband belongs to her. OK, so you, you can just see Jesus going, oh, my gosh. How long do I have to put up with these people? You know, I mean, come on, you pick this obscure passage out of the Bible and try to make it into it an issue about the resurrection and the passage has nothing to do with that. Um, and then you don't even know the power of God because look, we're not going to be marrying in heaven. We're going to be like the angels, Jesus says. Okay. Who don't have to, um, you know, to get married in order to reproduce because this is it. Whoever saved from this earth, that's it. There's no, we're not going to be populated by any more human beings. We're it. And that's why, you know, we shouldn't be practicing contraception. 
okay? Because we are making citizens for the kingdom of God. And this is it. We've got one shot at it on earth. And so if we're, you know, you know, thwarting God's plan by having just two or three children, well, we're going to pay the price for that in eternity. Okay? Because God wants some grandiose um, new heaven and new earth that is beyond our imagination, and we need citizens to populate it. Okay? Something beyond your imagination. And what a gift you're giving to the child you bring into the world, that he can be a part of that. Wow. What an opportunity. Okay? But if you of your selfishness are not doing your part and actually thwarting bringing children into the world because you want your pleasures, you know, or you want your wife to go out to work or all kinds of excuses we use, yeah, well, you've, you're making the kingdom of God suffer. Okay? So that's another aspect of this whole thing. So anyway, Jesus gets back to the story and says, you don't know the power of God. You don't know the scripture. And what he does is it's like tit for tat because he says, have you ever read this scripture? It's in Exodus 3, 6. And it says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So God is not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. Okay. So because the Pharisees thought that once Abraham died or anybody died and there was no resurrection, that was it. Life's over. Okay. Um, they don't explain where Abraham's soul goes, but if there's no resurrection, who cares? His soul's not going to be reunited with his body, that's for sure, wherever it is. So what did Jesus do? Well, he used a very obscure passage, Exodus 3, 6, to try to prove the point to the Sadducees. And <laughs> that's just tit for tat because the Sadducees are trying to do the same thing to Jesus. Use this obscure passage in Deuteronomy 25.5 to try to make their point about the resurrection. And, of course, Jesus deflated that one. <laughs> he goes, okay, while we're on obscure passages, check this one out. Here's Exodus 3, verse 6. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay, so, <laughs> in other words, the logic that flows from this, the deductive logic is that <coughs> if they're still living, and their bodies in the grave. Well, what does that mean? It means their soul is living and it's living with God in heaven. Okay. And it also means that they're going to have to have a body to be reunited with their soul, to be a complete personality. So just by the fact that they're living now means that they're going to have a body so that they can live in the new heaven and new earth for eternity. Okay, from this very obscure passage in Exodus 3 6. Now, Jesus could have used a number of passages in the Old Testament to prove the bodily resurrection. He could have used um, uh, Daniel 12, verse 2, very clear about the future bodily resurrection. Uh, he could have used Job 19 26, where Job says, uh, In my body, I will see my Redeemer. Um, was there, there's another passage too. Um, hmm, where is it? Isaiah. So Isaiah 19, 26, I think it is. Yeah. About the future resurrection. Okay. So, but Jesus only used the Pentateuch because the Sadducees would only pay attention to the Pentateuch, not these other passages, not Job or Daniel or Isaiah. Um, so, okay, so while we're here in the Pentateuch, Mr. Sadducee, let's take a look at this obscure passage, Exodus 3, 6, and we'll use our deductive logic in order to get to the position that's true, which is what Jesus did. And it was a beautiful display, and it also tells us that Scripture is full of these hidden messages that if we use our deductive logic, we can get to the truth. That's another thing about this whole scenario with the uh, with the Sadducees, that uh, any exegete of Scripture would just lick his chops at 
and say, wow, it's like an ocean under the ocean. You know, it's amazing. So anyway, let's go to our next question. I heard that you can read the entire Bible by attending Mass every Sunday for three years. True. I also heard that they skip sections such as on hell or homosexuality. Is this true? Um, the first question is true. Yes, every three years. I don't think it's actually every part of the Bible. Okay. Um, because yeah, that would take a lot more than three years, I think. Um, although it does come close, okay, to having the complete Bible there. Um, but you're not going to hear, you know, Leviticus chapter one in your Old Testament reading. You're not going to hear Numbers one or two or three <laughs> in your Old Testament because these are genealogies, you know, and yeah, chronologies, you're not going to hear that. So those those are taken out, okay? You might get the tail end of one or the beginning of one, but that's about it, okay? Uh, but most of the Bible there is there for three years. Uh, taken out once on hell or homosexuality, I have not heard that, and I, I don't think that's true. Now, nobody's ever asked me this question before, so I've never done a study on it, so I can't be certain, but... Um, you know, uh, Romans 1, which is one of the basic passages against homosexuality and God's judgment of hell. Um, yeah, I remember reading that in, in the Mass many times, okay, at least once every three years. So, yeah, so I can't say that um, what you're asking is um, has any truth to it. Okay, next question. What do you think about Carl Bow's model of the firmament? He says it is both an expanse, positron lattice, and dome. He calls the latter a microcosm of the firmament. That is, he's calling the positron lattice a microcosm of the firmament at the end of the cosmos. Um, I don't know what you mean by the end of the cosmos. Okay. Um, I would say this. It is not a dome. Okay. That is an idea that was foisted upon an interpretation of Genesis 1 by the liberals who want to make the Genesis writer some kind of ignorant person who doesn't know anything about science as if everything that's written in Genesis 1 has to come from the knowledge of the Genesis writer, okay? Whether it be Moses or somebody else really doesn't make any difference. Of course, Moses doesn't know about the cosmology, but God does, okay? And Moses wasn't there in the, in the, the creation days anyway, so it doesn't make any difference what kind of knowledge he has from his own experience, okay? Inspiration of the Holy Spirit in writing scripture is not limited to man's knowledge, uh, All that man's knowledge has to be comprehensive in order for the Holy Spirit to work through the vocabulary of that man and write, as our encyclicals tell us from many popes, what God wanted to put in scripture. OK, so um, we're not bound by Moses's knowledge of cosmology. God's the only one that was there when he created and he knows how he put it together. So we're not stuck with this idea that the firmament is the dome. OK. As a matter of fact, it doesn't make any sense. Because Genesis 1.20 tells us that the firmament is where the birds fly. They fly on the face of the firmament. Okay, face of the firmament. So that's the lower extremity of the firmament. And if the firmament is space, well, the lower extremity of that space is, of course, that which is nearest to the earth. 
And that's where the birds fly. That's where they live. Where birds walk on the ground too. Okay. So that's the firmament. But it also says in Genesis 1.14 that the sun and the stars and the moon were put in the firmament. But that's outer space. Okay. So it doesn't say they were put above the firmament or underneath the firmament. It says they were put in the firmament. So um, ben rakia would be the Hebrew word. The word ben is the pre preposition in. So it's in rakia. That means in the firmament. Not above it, not below it, in the firmament. The only way that you can have birds fly in the firmament and the stars in the firmament is for the firmament to be what? The whole universe. Not a dome. Okay? Not a dome. I think Carl is too fixated on the liberal interpretation of Genesis 1. But they're trying to do away with Genesis 1 having any scientific validity at all. And, and that's why they want to get rid of They want to put in this idea that the firmament is a dome. Because it makes the Genesis writer look stupid, makes him look primitive. And we all know better than he does today, you see, because we believe in the Big Bang and the multiverse and all this kind of garbage. Yeah, if they had paid attention to Genesis, they wouldn't have all the problems that they have today in trying to keep their Big Bang together, which is another story altogether. Now, um, regarding a positron, um, he probably means electron positron lattice, okay? Because you just can't have a positron lattice. If you had just a positron lattice, it would blow apart because the positron's a positive charge, electron's a negative charge, and they join together, okay? And this is an interesting little story here because in 1929, Paul Dirac, very famous physicist, had predicted that we would find the positron nobody had ever seen it before but he predicted that we would find it 1929 that's how good physics was that you could predict the existence of a positron and nobody had ever found it yet uh three years later a guy named carl anderson found the positron uh, they they put um, um, alpha, I think it was alpha particles in a, um, and that's just a helium nucleus. They put an alpha particle in a bubble chamber and they had, and they, and they bombarded it, broke it apart. And they had some bubbles go left, some bubbles go right. The ones that went left are the electrons. The ones that went right were the positrons. Okay. And that's what they would normally do. They would go away from each other because, you know, uh, they would take a different path because one's negative and one's positive. But to, if there's no disturbance, then together they stay fine. And that's the way they were uh, originally until they got broken apart. Okay, so they had a big battle at this point because um, they knew that when, when the positron broke apart from the electron, it created 1.0 million electron volts, 1.05 million electron volts. And they knew that if they got a electron and a positron and they put in 1.05 million electron volts, the positron and electron would come back together. Okay. Now, um, that was puzzling. And so the whole this whole idea about um, creating matter and destroying matter came from this puzzle of the electron and the positron. So instead of saying that when the electron and positron came back together, um, it created matter. The other guys were saying, no, it didn't create matter. The positron and the electron were always there. And the way we found out they were always there was because if you put 1.05 million electron volts in any open space, you're going to get an electron and a positron come out of it. The other guys were saying, well, that's creating matter. Elect you stick electrical charge in the air and you get the electron positron. That's creating matter. No. 
I mean, it means that the electron positron were already there. And the 1.05 million electron volts made them come apart. Okay. So science is divided ever since then, since 1932. And they can never get back together on this. I think the major part of them still think that matter is created by energy. And that's where E equals MC squared comes in. Okay. So what am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that it's not a positron lattice. If anything, it would be an electron positron lattice. And that would be a second type of ether. Okay. And the evidence is there that we have an ether, at least one ether, based on an electron positron lattice um, structure. And that and a lattice structure is like, um, like a, a diamond. Diamond is made up of carbon. And the carbon is put into a structure where it's all, it's, it's in cubes, okay? And that's what a lattice structure is, basically. The electrons and positrons are at each corner of the cube, and they're all connected, okay? And there's like 10 to the 30th electron-positron pairs per square centimeter. That's a lot. 10 to the 30th electron positron pairs per square centimeter. Uh, so they're all around us. Okay. And you can prove it by if you ever get into a laboratory, put a 1.05 million electron volt charge and in, discharge into the air, and you'll get an electron and a positron. Okay. So that part of Carl Bauer's theory has plausibility. Okay, and I write about that in my book, Galileo Was Wrong. The, the basal ether would have to be the smallest possible um, atomic, not atomic, um, smallest possible physical manifestation that nature can make and still be matter. And that's very, that's 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron-positron pairing. That goes down to 10 to the minus 35 meters, whereas the electron is at 10 to the minus 15 meters. Okay. So, yeah, this world is this firmament that God made. It's very complicated. It's it very complicated. We know of at least two layers of, of ether uh, in the firmament that God has made. Okay. Uh, so, but. But I don't know how Carl's going to fit that in with a dome. I mean, I just think that's, he's not, he's going to go nowhere with that. Okay. All right. Next question. Hello. Is it a known fact that Pope John the 23rd was a Mason? How on earth could we expect him to follow the request of the Blessed Mother to consecrate Russia? Yeah. Um, not only, um, John the 23rd, I think Paul the 6th was a Mason. Look, half our hierarchy in the time of John the 23rd uh, that, you know, consorted with him at the Vatican were Masons, Freemasons. There was a book, um, uh, what was the book called? It was handed out at Vatican II. And it talked about a list of all the Freemasons in the Catholic hierarchy. And it was a list probably of 100 names long. OK, so I didn't mean to say whole hierarchy. I just meant, you know, there were prominent members of the hierarchy, let's say, who were Freemasons. The 60s, 70s, 80s, they were a time in the Catholic Church. Uh, this church was being ripped apart from the inside in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And we're just seeing all the results of it now. But if you really want to read a book about Freemasonry and written by a secular guy, too, uh, who's the guy that uh, wrote um, about the assassination of John Paul I? There's another story for you. Um, In God's Name, it's called. That's the name of the book. In God's Name. Talk about a 
investigative researcher. This guy was in a class all by himself. It must have taken him years to collect all this information. His thesis is that John Paul I was assassinated by um, the Vatican hierarchy. And he makes a credible case. But then he gets into all the Freemasonry, the P2, which is a lodge, uh, the mafia, uh, uh, Van uh, Banco Ambrosiano, um, you know, uh, funneling, or what do they call that? Uh, laundering money for the mafia owned by the Vatican. Uh, Paul Marcinkus, Bishop Paul Marcinkus was running the whole show. He was being sought for by the Italian police and the Vatican protected him. And then John Paul II sent him over to the United States to escape being captured by the Italian police. You know, just like John Paul II took Cardinal Law. Uh, the Archbishop of of the Boston area, um, when he began to be sought by the police for his role in um, channeling homophobic, pedo, um, um, not homophobic, <laughs> homosexual pedophile priests from Paris to Paris. Yeah, all done by Cardinal Law. Well, John Paul II took Cardinal Law into the Vatican to protect him from being arrested by the Boston police. Okay. So this is the good old boy market, okay? A lot of bad things going on. Fortunately, Jesus is behind it, okay? Jesus knows it's all going on, and he preserves the church so that we can go to Mass every Sunday, okay? And we can have all the sacraments and everything else, and that will transpire until the end, as Jesus says, okay? In between time, we got some real rascals in the Catholic Church. Okay, that we have to deal with. So don't be surprised if you see that some of these guys are Masons. That was just par for the course. Okay. All right. Next question. Is the U.S. economy going to tank? Sooner or later, yeah, it's going to tank. You can't be $27 trillion in debt and not be able to pay it off and not have the consequences follow you accordingly. And the only reason we don't is because we hold the, the reserve currency, okay? We're the, the, we're the go-to guys for whether, when you need money because we're the reserve currency. And as I said earlier in the program, that's why we have such a big army. Navy, Coast Guard. Air Force, Space Force, you name it. Why? Because it all keeps the reserve dollar for the United States. So if you can control the money and you can make money at will and get yourself further into debt um, without anybody holding you responsible for it because you hold the reserve currency, yeah. But once that goes, when it goes, when all these other countries like Russia and China and Iran and all these other get smart and they say, you're not going to control it. We're going to draw a line in the sand. Okay. And um, that's what's happening right now. So it's going to be interesting to see how this all turns out for Russia. Because um, everybody knows it. Anybody who any, knows anything about the economies of the world knows this is the case. Okay, so it's no, I'm not saying anything that nobody else has ever said. It's just a fact of, you know, every once in a while, we need to, as Orwell said, go back to the beginning and read it all again and find out what's going on because it's unbelievable how we've gotten into this mess of 27 trillion. Um, and no way. And so we, we're just, we just broken the backs of our grandchildren before they even start in life, we've already broken their backs because this is going to come to haunt them, okay? All right, next question. Can we ever go back to Vatican I values? Well, um, no, because that was in 1870. <laughs> we live in a whole new world now, okay? Um, 
you know, you had no cars, no jet planes, no computers, no cell phones, no stock market. Um, you know, everything's different today. This is what Vatican II was supposed to prepare us for. The new world, the modern world, okay, which is very different from, you know, Vatican I's days. Um, now you know what somebody does the second they do it because it's all over the Internet. And nobody has any more privacy anymore. You know, in back in 1870, it took three weeks to get that message to somebody by horse. So the world moved a lot slower then. Okay. Now it moves very fast. And it moves so fast that it's scary how fast it is. And, you know, manufacturers can't keep a product on the market for more than a year or two because it's replaced by something bigger and better. Um, that's how fast it's improving. Well, when the computers first came out, I had a computer back in what, 19, early 1980s, that was 20 megabytes in memory, 20 megabytes. Now they measure your bytes in what, um, not, what's the next one after gigabytes, um, tetrabytes? Or on the computers you can buy at, um, you know, Walmart. And tetrabytes. So yeah, things have changed. We don't. We just don't live in that kind of world. And I think it's unhealthy for Catholics. Like some traditional Catholics want to go back to the 1950s or 1940s, and they even dress that way. You know, they wear the the mafioso kind of hats they wore. What, what, what do they call those? Um. um uh, I think you know what kind of tab, hat, hats I'm talking about. I, I can't remember the word right now. Um, and they want to dress like the 1950s. And so when they go to the traditional mass, that's what they look like. Like they just walked out of the 1950s. That's not healthy. Okay. That's not going to prepare your you and your kids and your grandkids for the modern world. We have a whole new world out there that needs conquering with the gospel. And we're going to have to dress the part, talk the part, walk the part in order to get to the hearts of these people. And so we need to come up to 2022 and let's work from there. OK, that's what Vatican II was trying to do is prepare us for this avalanche of modern thinking, modern technology that is as Daniel said in Daniel 12, knowledge will increase, and boy, has it increased, okay? From 0 AD to or 1 AD to, you know, 1800 AD was a drop in the bucket compared to how the world has progressed since then, since, you know, the 1850s onward to today. In the last 200 years or less, um, we have we have advanced further than all of human civilization has ever even dreamed of, much less done. So that's the kind of world we live in. So no, we don't want to go back to Vatican I. And as a matter of fact, Vatican II understood we have a whole new set of moral problems that never confronted Vatican I. And we have to address them in the modern age, you know, like surrogate motherhood or um, you know, artificial insemination or, you know, uh, all those kinds of things. These are all new. Whoever would have thunk? Transgenderism is another one. Okay. Whoever would have thunk that somebody's hormones could be reversed to make them look like a female or act like a female uh, and, and surgically give them female organs? Whoever would have thunk that? Okay. But that's what we have today. So there has to be moral decisions made on those. In vitro fertilization, um, um, euthanasia. You can kill somebody within seconds today just by giving them a shot of cyanide uh, or put it in a pill. Um, there's more ways to kill people today than you can shake a stick at. So um, all these have to be examined by the church. And um, that was not the error of Vatican I. Okay. All right. Next question. 
If you can predict Earth's orbit using your Newton's physics, can't that be equivalent to predicting the sun's orbit around the Earth in the geocentric model since they're kinematically equivalent? Well, of course. Yeah, I mean, the sun's going to go around the Earth in the geocentric model in 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.09 seconds every day. And the sun's going to go around, or the stars are going to go around the Earth. Um, or let's say, let's put it this way. The Earth is going to rotate in 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4.09 seconds every day under fixed stars. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, the measurements have already been made. So, each model... Whatever model it is, heliocentrism, geocentrism, or acentrism, they all have to fit what's already been measured. And if they don't, then they're rejected. Okay. So the geocentric model has to fit into the times and seasons that have already been calculated. Okay. And they do. See, that's what makes a competition for the heliocentric model. As a matter of fact, <coughs> we can explain why these times and seasons work so well in the geocentric system better than they do in the heliocentric system. One reason is how can you keep such a precise daily time of 23 hours, 56 minutes and 4.09 seconds every single day? How do you do that with an Earth that's rotating? It would be impossible. It could keep it for a while, but then it's going to slow down. Because it has too many gravitational and inertial forces, inside and outside, that are trying to slow it down. Okay? And sooner or later, it's going to succumb. If you have a rotating Earth. A rotating universe, you would never have that problem. Because the universe is so big and massive, I'm talking about mass, uh, that its angular momentum is unstoppable. Okay, Once you start that thing spinning, it's going to go on and on and on and on, and it's going to go on at the same rate every single day. That's a stable universe. Okay, So we have one up on the heliocentrist. That's it. We have a much more stable universe. And we can explain a lot more things than they can. They can't explain the superluminal speed of light because they have a, uh, if they want an absolute universe that doesn't move, then it's inertial. It's an inertial frame. And light's going to always be 186,000 miles a second. In a rotating universe, it's not an inertial frame. It's a non-inertial frame, and light can travel any speed. So all that starlight, we don't have to wait millions of years for it to come in. It can come in in 24 hours. Yeah, by the theory of general relativity, believe it or not. Okay, so we're way ahead of these guys. It's just gonna, it's going to take them years to catch up. Um, but, you know, there's more behind this than you know, what goes around what. What's behind it is if I admit to a geocentric universe, that means I admit that God exists. And that's what the, where the battle is. They really don't care what goes around what. And only they only care about what goes around what symbolizes to them. And a geocentric universe symbolizes that God's the creator and put us in the center. Because that's not going to happen by chance. They know that. If the earth is in the center, God exists. End of story. Okay. So if you were a scientist and you didn't believe in God because you are you know you're a sinner and you know if you would admit God exists that he, he's going to judge you for your sins, what kind of cosmology are you going to make up? Yeah, one that takes Earth out of the center and puts it on the you know, remote recesses of space and says it's expanding along with the rest of the universe. That's going to make you comfortable. You say, that's what's behind this. Anyway, next question. 
Do you ever plan on doing Apologetic Study Bible on the other four books of the Torah? Incredible job on everything you've done. Well, thank you, Joe. Um, you know, Joe, if I had three lifetimes, I could do that. Um, but I'm finding it hard to do the New Testament in the lifetime that I have. So <laughs> what I think, I, I, I was thinking about this. Once I get done the New Testament, and I've got Luke and Acts to go to complete the uh, second volume. And um, so that's just right around the corner. Luke, I've already got done um, probably about two-thirds of it. So, um, so once that's done, which should be in the next year, um, I, I thought that I would take the most important passages from the Old Testament and put them into one volume, say of 500, 600 pages. Um, you know, like Genesis 1 to 11 would be important. Genesis 12, 13, 14, up to 22 would be important. The rest of Genesis, you know, just a lot of narrative that's not quoted in the New Testament a lot. So not, you know, they're all important, but not important on the scale that I'm making. Um, maybe a chapter or two out of Exodus, first 10 chapters, uh, at least the, the parts that Paul quotes in Romans and other places. Um, you know, some of the unique passages and numbers. Uh, and then through the, throughout the Old Testament, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, you know, 1st, 2nd Samuel, all the important passages um, that are mainly what people look up when they go to the Old Testament for one reason or another. Put them all together in one volume. You know, the Reader's Digest condensed Roberts and Jenna's version of the Old Testament. <laughs> um, that's a possibility. I might, you know, if I still have the energy and if I can still walk and talk, um, you know, I'll use that energy for the Lord as long as I have a breath in me. And um, that's probably what I'll do. Um, so that, that could be uh, in the offing. Okay. Thank you, Joe, for your question. Next question. If the universe is not expanding, how do you account for the observed Hubble redshift? Can something else be responsible for the redshift? Yes. Yes, there's about 60 different reasons why we could have a redshift. Okay. And who's the guy uh, who put that together? Um, I want to say Alan Sandage, but I don't think he's the guy. Um, I'd have to go back. I think it's in Galileo was wrong, where there are now 60 explanations for why we would have a redshift. Okay. Um, the one of the first ones that Hubble uh, realized, uh, you know, just by logical deduction, was that space is filled with all kinds of dust. Um, you may not think so, but you know, it looks clear to you, but believe me, there's dust out there. And when light goes through dust, it slows down. Okay. And if it slows down, it's going to have a, 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 a shift to the red end of the spectrum. Okay. Um, so because if light slows down, like it does in water, for example, you know, light goes two thirds of its speed in, uh, as it does in air, in water. So um it's doesn't have the same energy and if that's the case it's sh shifting to the red end of the spectrum that's one possibility okay we have another possibility in a geocentric universe it could be i'm not saying it is it could be that the inertial forces um work on uh, as they do in um uh, what they call the uh, gravitocentrifugal inertial force could be stretching the wavelength of the light. And if it does, it's going to go to the red end of the spectrum. Okay. 
Now, um, <clears throat> some people would say, well, then that means you're going to get more redshift on the equatorial plane than you are on the north-south pole. And that would be true, of course, if the universe wasn't also rotating in a an orthogonal direction. The, um, so it would have two, um, two spins, basically. We would never be able to tell because when your north-south celestial plane is moving uh, in a circular direction, you're not going to be able to tell, okay? We can only tell whether the equatorial uh, plane is rotating around us, okay? Because we see the stars and the sun move around us east to west every day. But you wouldn't be able to tell that if you had a north-south celestial plane uh, rotating. Okay, now where I'm getting this from is St. Hildegard, the, um, the uh, prodigy of her day that made a Tychonic geocentric universe in 1180 AD, long before anybody was talking about what goes around what, including Nicholas of Cusa and Giordano Bruno, and Galileo, and Copernicus, and Redicus, and Newton, and everybody. She was talking about it and writing it down and, and saying to us that um, the universe not only goes around equilaterally on its equator, but also north and south goes around. So if that was the case, that's correct then we're going to see redshift in the north and south pole just as much as we do in the equatorial plane, okay? So that's one way to answer that question. So what I'm saying basically is there's a lot of ways other than an expanding universe to, to account for redshift. And Hubble was our first source for that when he said that when light goes through dust, it creates a redshift. But see, he didn't like that answer. Why? Because it still kept the Earth in the center of the universe. And it would mean that we have dust all around us in every direction with the Earth in the center. And so wherever the light comes from, it goes through dust and hits us at Earth, and it always has a redshift. If that wasn't the case, if the Earth was off-center, okay, then we would see some blue shifts, even though it has to go through dust, because it wouldn't have to go through a lot of dust. Okay? Maybe they wouldn't be exactly blue, but maybe they'd be orange instead of red. Okay, so, yeah, he didn't like that answer. And so, wow, what do we do now? Well, let's just do away with the center. Let's just do away with Euclidean geometry altogether and create a balloon universe and put all the galaxies on the skin of the, uh, the balloon universe. And if you do that and blow it up so it expands, well, you're going to see redshift from every galaxy. Ingenious, but totally absurd. <laughs> All right, next question. Robert, I have a question for Dr. Zess. A friend of mine, a friend asked me, who did Adam and Eve children marry? I don't have the answer. Please help me. Okay, what is it? Genesis... Um, Four, verse 11, 12, 13, right around there, where it said um, Adam and Eve had other children, okay? So, you know, they could have had 10 children, but their names aren't in the Bible, so we don't know who they were. We just know that they, they would have existed. Now, I'm just picking the number 10 out of thin air, okay? I don't know how many children they had. It just says they had other brothers and sisters, these um three that are mentioned, Seth, Abel, and Cain. So that's who they married, okay? Now, at that time, um, the gene pool was not um, dilapidated like our gene pool is today. So if you marry your first cousin, you're going to have some retarded children, okay? We figured that out. Uh, but that was not the case back with Adam and Eve in their day, and not for a long time. Remember, these people are the ones that lived 900 years old. So not too much was wrong with their genes. 
Okay, they were healthy specimens, and it wasn't until after the flood, because even Noah lived to 950. 600 of those years was before the flood. Okay, so he was still pretty healthy, like Adam was, um, and then managed to live another 350 years after the flood. Uh, but after the flood, things changed. The climate changed. And men started to live less and less and less. And you could imagine, you know, cosmic rays, um, depleted oxygen in the air. Who knows what it was? I mean, there could be all kinds of deleterious effects from a global flood. Um that would affect our human physiology and um, it would not be as strong as it was and therefore could not combat uh, marrying your first cousin anymore. You know, the, the weakness of the body would uh, allow the potentialities of um, something <clears throat> uh, physiologically unacceptable or dangerous to, to make to, you know, rise to the surface at that time. Okay. So, you know, they could marry their brother and sister back in Adam and Eve's day without any problem whatsoever. Okay. All right. Next question. Are scientists confusing an angular acceleration rotation of the universe for a linear outward ex acceleration? I don't think they're confusing it. Okay. Uh, in other words, it's not like, well, we have a choice. Do we want a rotating universe or an expanding, linear, linearly expanding universe? It's not like they sit down and say, you know, which one of these shall we choose? Okay. They choose a linear expanding universe because that's what Hubble gave them. Hubble was a genius. And he gave them this linear expansion because that's the only way he could explain redshift without putting the earth in the center. So that's why they choose it. Okay. The last thing they would want to do is choose an accelerating angular, uh, accelerating universe. Okay. Cause what does that spell? It's, it just would upset everything Hubble gave them. Okay. Hubble wanted to keep the earth out of the center. And they know an angular accelerating universe is going to put the Earth back in the center. So that's not even an option for them. Okay? All right, next question. Are you excited for your debate with Kelly Powers? I hope you utterly annihilate this guy. <laughs> He's really just trying to make a name for himself in the apologetic world. It'll be an easy win for you. Um, yeah, I had forgotten about that debate until I got reminded. Um, so, yeah, Friday at 9.30 p.m. on, um, who's the guy, Donnie? Uh, I forget his last name. Anyway, um, I hadn't done a debate. Um, James White won't debate me anymore, so I'm looking for somebody to debate. Um, so Kelly Powers came on the list. I, I don't know him, never met him, never talked to him. He was supposed to call me and, and he wanted to chat, but he never did call me. Um, so, you know, I never take, let's put it this way. Um, how do they say that? Never, never over uh, underestimate your opponent. Okay. I'm one of those kind of guys where. I, I'll treat Kelly like he was, you know, um, I don't know, um, a genius, re ready, to, ready to conquer the Catholic Church. That's how I go into a debate. So, um, and I don't go in there with the uh, motive of annihilating him. I go in there with the motive of telling the truth of the Catholic Church, and I let the truth speak for itself. If it doesn't convince Kelly... I'm not worried because there's a whole lot of other people out there I know will be affected by what I have to say. And that's the reason I do debates. It's not for Kelly Powers or James White. It's for the people that are listening. Okay. And I know because they write to me and tell me. 
You know, I listened to that debate you had with James White, and I'm a Catholic now. I get that all the time. Okay, so um, that's what I do it for. So we'll see what happens. Next question. When is the six-day DVD series going to be available? Oh. Um, my colleagues have been dragging their feet. I'm going to be very honest with you. And I have been getting in an uproar, and they know that because I've told them. Um, and um, we're reaching a resolution now, and we just talked about this today, as a matter of fact, through email. And um, um, I'm not a happy camper, okay? I'll, t I'll, I'll just lay it out like that. I'm not a happy camper. I wish it was done yesterday. Um, but I can tell you this, we are making progress, as slow as it may seem. And um, we're just going to have to wait to see what happens. But what we have planned now was we're going to do the greatest job on this we can, and we're going to release one day at a time. So the first day of creation, we're going to release that by download, streaming, and maybe DVD. Um, and then about a month later, two months later, I don't know, we'll release day two. And then, you know, a month later, six weeks later, two months later, I don't know, we'll release day three. And then day four, day five, day six, and day seven. So um, that's the game plan. And then after all those days are done, then we'll put it all in one DVD package, all seven days. I can tell you this, though, that it's going to be spectacular. It's going to be like nothing you've ever seen before. Okay. Um, despite all the opinions out there, Genesis 1 can be taken literally, and it is one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen when you take it literally, and you see why God put the days in as he did, because once you see the scheme, then you see how they all fit together, and it doesn't bother us that the earth of course is first because we believe the earth is in the center anyway so basically we're going to show you a geocentric creation and that's the way it all fits together because once you put the earth in the center then you can build everything around it and the lights are no longer confusing and the firmament's no longer confusing and the water that's with the earth in the first that's no longer confused everything works together just like clockwork and um, so in that sense, it's going to be fantastic. But then the graphics that we're putting in there are going to be spectacular as well. So it's worth waiting for the finished product. That's, that's all I have to say. And um, believe me, I'm trying to push it as fast as I can. But sometimes the mule just doesn't want to move. And you have to wait until he gets into a better mood. So that's where I'm at right now with that. All right, next question. Has anyone asked Bob how Francis' intended consecration of Russia affects his current position on historical consecrations? Oh, we already answered that, Koru. Um, I just said it's all theater, okay? Whether if heaven wants to bless whatever. Pope Francis wants to do, that's heaven's prerogative. I'm, of course, not going to stand in the way of that. Okay, but that's assuming that heaven will do something. Um, I think Francis has got the whole thing, as they say, ass backwards. Okay, in trying to make Russia the villain that needs to be consecrated means he doesn't know what the true story is. Okay, that's what I had said earlier in the program. And so this, you know, heaven, again, is not telling Francis to do a consecration of Russia. Heaven did not tell John Paul II to do a consecration of Russia. He told Pius XI and Pius XII, period. Okay? So all this, you know, I'm going to do the consecration of Russia that nobody else has done. It's all theater. That's what I called it. Okay? That's my opinion. If you want my opinion, 
you come to this channel at Wednesday, 8 to 10 p.m. <laughs> you get my opinion. All right, next question. In Luke 16, 15, which law is Jesus talking about? Now, usually I'm able to remember, but I will... I am forced to open up the Bible here. Six, Luke 16, 15. And he said unto them, You are they which justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination of the sight. The law and the prophets were until John, since it's that time the kingdom. So I don't know which law are you talking about here. Luke 16, 15 does not have a law. Now, in maybe you're thinking of verse 16. It says the law and the prophets were until John. So, you know, the law would be, of course, the Mosaic law and any laws that came after that. Um, some, you know, even the Psalms contain some laws, if you want to get technical about it. And the prophets, of course, would be everyone from, um, you had prophets in, um, not as much, but you have probably in Moses' day, in the judges' day, in Samuel's day, and then they increased in Elijah's day. So that's the prophets that he's talking about there. So, you know, but other than that, I don't see any law in Luke 16, 15. So we'll have to pass on this question. Uh, next question. Some Catholics believe marijuana use is sinful, but never answer my question. Why did God create man with cannabinoid receptors in the human brain, CB1 and CB2 especially? Please explain. <laughs> I'm not laughing at your question. Um, cannabinoid receptors in the brain? I don't think so. Okay. Um, receptors, neuron receptors, yeah, but not just for cannabinoid material, for many different things. We have receptors in the brain. Okay. We don't have like a receptor for each chemical that could possibly be made in our brain. So, it's wrong to say that it's a cannabinoid a cannabinoid re receptor as if that's the only thing that that receptor does is is receive cannabinoid okay um <laughs> so um I, so i answered your question basically but i think what you're asking for is a little bit more what i think you're asking for whether marijuana use is morally acceptable or not okay um you know if it you know right away what anyone who is familiar with this topic is going to do is compare you know um, cannabinoid use with alcohol you know alcohol is still responsible for 40 percent of the accidents we have on the highway every single year 50,000 to 60,000 people die on our highways every year at least 20,000 of those are caused by alcohol okay so somebody would say that's pretty dangerous substance isn't it yeah if you look at it from that perspective okay but yet the bible does not prohibit alcohol use okay it prohibits excess use so we know there's a distinction okay um 
from there, someone can make an argument that tetrahydrocannabinol has medicinal properties. And that's been clinically proven. Okay. So if a state in the United States wants to use marijuana for medicinal purposes, that's perfectly legal if the state has allowed it. And there's a lot of scientific evidence to back that up. Okay. Especially for cancer patients. Um, and a lot of other things that you would not normally think, but, um, and a lot of times they can take the hallucinogen out of the cannabinol molecule so that you're just left with the beneficial effects without the hallucinogenic effects of marijuana. And that's where the real question is, isn't it? It's not the mar it's not, not the tetrahydrocannabinol itself, it's the hallucinogenic properties that's got people worried. Because if you're smoking marijuana and behind the wheel, well, you may not be as inebriated physiologically as you would be with alcohol with marijuana, but there's going to be some ill effects. And if there's just a little ill effects driving a car, you're going to cause accidents and you're going to kill people. Okay. So that's the problem. Okay. Is we have a hard enough time dealing with alcohol. Trying to we we tried to regulate that at one time in the 1920s, and that wasn't successful because all they did was, you know, have their back rooms when they made their moonshine and everybody had their alcohol. A little bit more expensive, but it was still there. So if you wanted it, you knew where to go get it. Okay. And it got so bad that they just took away the law. Said we, we can't control it. Okay. And you know, if the Bible had condemned the use of alcohol, then that'd be a different story because then it would be a sin to drink alcohol. But it's not. Okay. It's a sin to drink it in excess. Okay. And I think the excess argument also works for marijuana. Anything outside of clinically observed marijuana use for health reasons at this time is an excess. Okay. Because we really don't know all the ramifications of using marijuana. They are a lot more than alcohol. With alcohol, you know, you're going to get cirrhosis of the liver and other, you know, deleterious physiological effects. Um, your, your lifespan's not going to be that long, uh, things. So, but we can calculate what they are. With marijuana, we don't know. It's like an abyss to try to find out what are the repercussions from continued marijuana use, okay? Um, to something like somebody having hallucinations five years after they quit marijuana. Now, if you're having a hallucination and you're driving a car and you've quit marijuana after five years, you're going to get into an accident and kill somebody. Okay. So, you know, that's the problem with marijuana. It's not as, as an exact science as it is using alcohol. We know how many drinks you can have. We know that if you go over a 0.1 or a 0.08 alcohol level, you're intoxicated and you shouldn't drive and you should fi find a designated driver. We, we've worked that out, okay? With marijuana, it hasn't been worked out. And it's going to take a long time to work anything out with, with that drug. And the marijuana that's used today is a lot more powerful than it was back in the 60s, you know, with the hippies and the yippies. Uh, it's like 10 times more powerful. So, um, and kids who don't know what they're doing, teenagers who start using marijuana. And then marijuana inevitably leads to other kinds of drugs because marijuana can just get you so high. And then you get onto cocaine and heroin and all kinds of bad things that do absolutely destroy your brain and your body. Okay. So, not a very good scene for marijuana. All right, next question. 
I am truly confused. If Adam and Eve had twins and Cain killed Abel as they grew up, then who did Cain have children with? Were there other humans here? Yes. Uh, this question was asked earlier, Susanna. I, maybe you weren't here. Um, what is it? Genesis uh, 4, verse 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, right around there. It said Adam and Eve had other children. Okay, so that means Cain and Abel. <clears throat> and um, Seth, the other son in Genesis 5, 1 had a brothers and sisters. Now, they may have had 10, 15, who knows? <laughs> they, they could have had a lot. So, and remember, these people lived a long time, okay? Adam lived for 950 years. So, uh, he could have had a lot of uh, children, okay? And they could form cities by the time you get to Genesis 4, 5, 6, and become so multiplied that you have millions of people on the earth. That could be done. Okay. Um, and then you had the flood that killed them all. Okay. But that's just within the first six chapters of Genesis. So we must have had a lot of procreation going on from Genesis 4, 5, and 6 to fill the earth with millions of people. Okay. Um, yeah, they were busy. Let's put it that way. And so Cain had a lot to choose from, even though he went to the land and, you know, was banished. And he would have found some females, believe me, because they had lived and grown and spread far and wide by that time. Uh, so, yeah, there's really no problem here at all. OK. All right. Next question. What does it mean to honor your parents? My parents aren't Christian but of the Sikh Hindu religion. Becoming a Christian would mean becoming a pariah to them and my family in general. Well, um, um, Cephas, this is what you're going to have to um, realize about becoming a Christian. It, it may be that you have to reject your family. Remember Jesus said, if you don't hate father or mother, brother or sister, um, then you can't be a follower of mine. Okay, and it's the word, same word, hate that we normally use in other places. Okay, now he didn't mean that you have some kind of vicious animosity toward them. It just means you hate what they stand for, because they don't stand for Jesus, and you hate their what they live for and um, their motivations and all that. You just hate it because it's not Christian. Okay, so. This is a question you have to face. And once you make that decision, I guarantee, Cephas, you're going to say, whatever took me so long to do this? <laughs> after, after you make the decision, that's what you're going to say to yourself. Why didn't I do this earlier? Okay? So that's what you have to do. All right? Let's everybody pray for uh, Cephas tonight. And he's, he's got a big decision to make, and uh, he needs a lot of strength. So everybody will say a prayer for you tonight, Cephas. Hopefully, um, God will help you. Okay, it's um, I'm only going to be here for, let me see, I got minute 53. I was late, wasn't I? So I should give you 10 more minutes. Um, so what do you think of the thesis of information, which is non-material, as the basis of the physical reality instead of energy? Some equate it with, and God said, let there be. Um, <laughs> this whole debate in physics about, you know, in black holes, whether there can be information saved even though the black hole sucks everything into it that was hawking's big thing i think that's the basis between uh, of hawking radiation he even had a certain radiation named after him i may be wrong there i'm not positive but i think that's where it may be coming from but um you see if you live 
and an impersonal world like these physicists do. Because, see, they don't believe in God. They don't believe in a personal God that is the source of information. Okay? Like the, the DNA code. Where did that come from? That's all information. You know, you've got these four proteins um, mixed up in various ways that makes every single part of your body. Talk about information. That's like the epitome of information. So where does that come from? So in the, these physicists can't say that that the information just sort of produces itself. Uh, they need some preservation of the information because if you're going to build a DNA molecule, you better save that information. Okay, or else the, race, the human race is not going to be able to exist. You've got to save that information. So it's just important. It's just as important to have the saving of information as it is to have the information. That's just like saying God created Adam and Eve, but He didn't create a way for them to reproduce. Well, then what good is the human race if you can't reproduce? You see, so the information is passed from one being to another because the Part of the information in the DNA code and RNA code is the ability to pass on the information. Okay, that's part of the DNA code, passing on the information. Um, there are even special molecules made in the DNA from the DNA to help the DNA keep reproducing itself. <laughs> so, so that that information problem is solved. But for an image from an impersonal a physical perspective where the you think the universe is either infinite or you would have to believe that it's either that or the multiverse. Um, how is that information can continue to be transferred? Okay, especially if you have black holes all over the place and you've got destruction of this or that and the other thing. Okay, so that's what they're all worried about. Because if you if you don't have a basis to keep the information flowing, then that means your whole system is wrong. Because obviously, if you can't keep the information flowing, your system can't exist. Okay, so that's why they're so worried about it. I hope I, hope I answered your question, but it has nothing to do with God saying, let there be. Let, let me put it that way. All right, question. Is it possible that John Paul I is a martyr if he was killed for not being corrupt. And what what was John Paul I like? Um, John Paul I was very affable. Always, he was called the smiling pope. Um, wherever you saw him in public, and there were tons of pictures taken of him, go, look on the internet you, and just put in John Paul I images. Of course, you'll get a lot of John Paul II coming up there, but um, you'll see in almost every photo, he's smiling. So that's why he was called a smiling pope. And I think he had the personality to match that smile from everything that I saw of him for the short 33 days that he was in office. And as far as being a martyr, um, yeah, I mean, if he was assassinated by his own hierarchy, uh, definitely be a martyr. Uh, but you won't see his name coming up for sainthood anytime soon, I don't think. Um, and we'll, but you, you never know what Francis is going to do. Yeah. <laughs> All right, next question. Uh, do evil people who rise to power, realize they're demon-possessed. <laughs> Actually, some of them do. Anton LaVey. Uh, who's that other guy um, from Europe? Oh, I forget his name now. Yeah, they, they knew it, 
and promoted it and uh, demanded it from their followers. Oh, yeah. Not all of them, but there's a large portion of them know they're demon possessed and they want it. Okay. They want it. Uh, Bohemian Grove. I don't know if you've heard about Bohemian Grove, where many of the leaders of the world go. And um, it's openly sat satanic. Okay. So, yeah, they know too. Um, yeah. Uh, two, are tyrants who rise to power necessarily always possessed or not always? Um, I would say there would be few tyrants that aren't possessed. Now, now when I use the word possessed, I'm using it in the very generic sense, okay? Um, meaning this, that not every demon-possessed person you see is going to be foaming at the mouth and, and you know, cracking their limbs till they break or whatever, or turning their head around 360 degrees. <laughs> They're, they're, most of them that you meet are not that way, okay? Yeah, some, a lot of people you see walking down the street are demon-possessed, but the demon's quiet because he's got a nice home to live in. And every once in a while, show his ugly face and make the person do something that they wouldn't normally do. But the, for the large part, they're quiet because they have a nice place to live and they don't want anybody disturbing them. And when they're forced to leave, that's when they raise a ruckus. Ask any exorcist, and he'll tell you that. Okay? So, yeah, you could see a lot of demon-possessed. Uh, well, you won't be able to see the characteristics, but you will know that, yeah, the probability of them being possessed by a demon is very great. Okay? So, yeah, the music industry especially. I mean, some of these people who become the the stars of the music industry, they will tell you, or you find out by doing some investigative research that it's satanically controlled and they're told what to say, what to do. Some examples like uh, Led Zeppelin, Jimmy Page said he was possessed by the devil whenever he played his guitar. And that's how he could play it so masterfully. Um, you know, examples like that. There's other um, um, music um, leaders that say the same thing. Um, they will admit that they, they are possessed by the devil and they, they worship the devil. Okay. Yeah, you need to read some books on rock and roll in the music industry from a Christian perspective. I mean, I've read a, a few of them myself and you, it'll, it'll just make you like, I just can't believe what I'm reading. Okay, so yeah, try to look up a few sources. All right, I want to take one more question, and then I got to leave you tonight. So, who's the lucky Clinton? Hyun. How would you argue for the monarchy being the best form of church government over a democracy or an aristocracy? Well, aristocracy, of course, has its own problems because only rich people, and, um, you know, form the aristocracy. Um, democracy, basically all a democracy is, is um, you have um, someone give a thesis, someone give an antithesis, and then the result is a synthesis, as the dear philosopher Hegel told us. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it, that's an illusion that you're going to get the best for the people possible because you have two entities that are opposed to one another and that the, the best man wins, so to speak. Okay. That's what the synthesis is. Um, and, and, and you have to be. The, the illusion of a democracy as the, is that the politicians really care for you. Now, out of human kindness and human nature, yes, there are politicians that actually do care for their people. Okay. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. What I'm saying is it's not as strong as it would be in a monarchy. Okay. A monarchy is 
they worked so well for so long because the monarchy has a vested interest in taking care of its people, okay? Because it's a family dynasty, so to speak, and they get to know their people. And it's like a camaraderie between the, the rulers and the people that is the most efficient, the most productive of any we've ever had in the human race, okay? So now here's the problem with the monarchy. When you get a bad king, everybody's as much as they benefit when he's a good king, you they they suffer when he's a bad king. I mean, look at Henry the Eighth. Okay. This man created his own religion because the Pope said that he couldn't get divorced to get married to the person he wanted to get married to. He left the church and he was one of the church's greatest apologists, always defending the Pope and the Catholic Church until the church said, you can't get divorced and remarried. And Henry said, bye, went to England and he made his own religion, the Anglican religion. What a legacy, huh? That's where they started. Okay, so when a king goes bad, like Henry VIII, you got you got big problems. Okay, so in the end, no form of government is going to be perfect. No, none is going to be that superior to the other. That you say, oh yeah, this is the one we pick. You know. Um, You see, in the and you in a monarchy, however, you don't have the problem of somebody stealing an election from you, <laughs> because you know the king's son is going to be the next ruler, and you coddle that son and you teach him, and uh, you make a big deal about him, and you make sure he has everything he needs so that when he does become king, he's going to be a good king. And most time, that's what happens. The people have a vested interest in taking care of the king's son so that he grows up to be a good man and a good king, okay? Because they know who the next leader is going to be. But in a democracy, who knows who the next leader is going to be, okay? The guy with the most money. Yeah. The guy with the most pool on all the lobbies. The guy who's friendliest with the stock market. You know, this is what happens in a democracy. A democracy can be bought by the richest people. And if they don't win, look what happened in the last election. Yeah, the six states, the six problem states was where all the elections were overturned. Okay? So if you don't have if you can't get it by by hook, you get it by crook. That's what happens in a democracy. Because you don't know who the next leader is going to be, as you do in a monarchy. Monarchy's safe in that direction, you see. If I know the king's son, John, is going to be the next king, man, I'll do everything I can to watch John grow up the best he can grow up. And he'll return the favor someday, okay, by keeping the people safe. And democracy... You never know. Okay. It's hit or miss. All right. That will be the last question. Um, we'll see you again next week from 8 to 10 p.m. That will be Wednesday, March the 25th. So we'll see you then. Now, please stop over at robertsandgenis.org. We've got some great books and DVDs and all kinds of good things for you. And if you would, Please uh, slip a donation to us. Uh, you can just tap on the donation button, and it'll take you to the place where you can give us a little pittance. And um, if you want to become a monthly donor, please feel free to do that. And um, that's about it. So um, see you next week. Take care. God be with you all. God love you.